All right, let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much once again for this tremendous opportunity to gather together as family in the unity of faith, Father, a faith that you've given us by grace as an expression of your love. Father, thank you so much for the completed canon of Scripture. For This is what we are prepared to dine on this evening, and we're so very grateful for its presence in our lives, Father, its availability to us. May we never become familiar with it, but rather embrace it for what it truly is, an expression of your grace and your love. Father, we pray for those in our congregation that are still ill, that earnestly desire to be here with us this evening, and that your will be done, of course, but that you heal them readily so that we might fellowship with them again sometime soon. Father, we pray also for those still lost in this world, that we might be given an opportunity by your grace to evangelize them so that we might rejoice the way the angels rejoice even with yet another saved soul. Father, we're most grateful and thankful, of course, for your son's work on the cross to cancel out that debt against us and make an evening like this even a reality. We're so very grateful. We just ask for your blessings on this evening's message. May it be edifying for our souls. We ask this in Jesus Christ's precious name. By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Again, what is repentance and who gets to define it? Part 18. Uh, we need to get back to our primary course of study now uh, so we can close up shop and move on. And I was thinking about that this morning when I was preparing. For the record, I have no idea uh, where the Spirit's about to take us. And I find that very exciting, frankly. Um, because there's just so many things that we could study out uh, in detail. So I'm really excited. I am hopeful, though, of one area personally, but you know how that goes. If I mention it, I will surely be shamed and humbled. <laughs> He'll just show me that I'm just a servant. I'm just a waiter going back to the, the kitchen and picking up whatever meal uh, is appropriate for all of you. Um, so I was thinking about that, and I, I say, let's just do as our Lord Jesus Christ suggested and focus on today. We humans are so good at worrying about the future, aren't we? I mean, some of you probably sat down this evening, and it's not even tomorrow yet. It's not even after class yet, and your minds are preoccupied with things that, are in the future. And you know what the one constant about the future is? It hasn't happened yet. You have no idea. You could step off the, God, hopefully this doesn't happen. You could step off the curb over there, trip, twist your ankle, and end up at the hospital. And your plans are all ruined. Go to Matthew 6.24. Some of you are much more worried about, you know, financial things, as if God can't take care of you. Um, you know, your career, your school, your friends, your friendships, your kids, your parents, your aunts and uncles, and I mean, your cats, your dogs, your gerbils, your <laughs> ferrets, your pigs. I don't know. People are funny, right? <laughs> Matthew 6, 24. What does Jesus have to say about all this? No one can serve two masters. Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. That seems to be the American way. Everything we seem to do hinges upon the pursuit of financial so-called success. It's just a trap. You cannot serve God and wealth. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air, that they do not sow, nor reap, nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you, by being worried, can add a single hour 
to his life. And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, for your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Pretty sound advice from the most or the wisest man to ever walk the face of the earth. Do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will care for itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. Who can honestly say that at some point in this day you didn't worry about tomorrow? It's just a habit. It's a debilitating, excruciating at times habit that is one of our worst as human beings because, as I said at the start of class, and as Jesus is plainly stating here, you don't even know what tomorrow brings. And what are you worried about anyways? God's going to provide. Either you have that as faith or you don't. So, the reason I read that, rather than guessing where the Spirit's going to take this congregation next, let us do this simple thing and settle into this evening's message and see what he's got in store for us this fine day. If you recall, the last two series, the first being a 17-part series on what is good and who gets to define it, and our current 18-part series so far on what is repentance and who gets to define it, in both series we've been learning about good definitions, good definitions and how important they are to our spiritual lives. We've also seen how fundamental good definitions are to the gospel itself. And we're seeing the, um, the workings, if you would, of the God of this world, Satan, and how he doesn't necessarily always launch a frontal assault on the gospel because most of us are wise enough to say, get out of here. What he does is he takes the side routes. He flanks us by chipping away or eroding at our definitions for certain things that are really the underpinnings of the gospel. Grace, love, mercy, salvation, forgiveness, all these kinds of things. And so Satan's smart enough to do that. And so God the Holy Spirit's been blessing us with these lessons that really are ferreting out what good definitions are to the gospel even. And in particular, how a single bad definition, for example, grace or love, you choose, can undermine the gospel truth. How a single bad definition can undermine the gospel truth. A perfect example of this is with the definition of grace. God's grace expresses itself, as we know, through mercy and love. And sometimes that love is a difficult pill to swallow. And that's what makes a church like this, frankly, unpopular. Because we're not afraid. I'm not afraid to lead you in love. I'm not afraid to tell you the absolute truth as it stands in Holy Scripture. It may be offensive. It certainly will be offensive to your flesh. This we know. But what am I supposed to do? Shrink away to my own shame? Am I going to represent Jesus Christ or not? Sometimes love is tough, and sometimes it's a difficult pill to swallow. But let me ask you a little array of questions. Is it more or less loving to tell a person the whole truth? Go to Galatians 4.16. Galatians 4.16, the question on the table right now is, is it more or less loving to tell the person the whole truth 
as opposed to, let's say, part of it. Because part of it would be more palatable. Part of it would make it more digestible for most humans. And isn't that what we're in? Aren't we in the game of, uh, of trying to get people through those doors, trying to get people in the church? Pro- profession of faith is not possession of it. That's what the Spirit's been teaching us. There's a lot of gum flapping out there in Christian churches. Oh, I believe in Jesus Christ. Do you? Because there's actually evidence of saving faith. And some might call it out as a transformed life even. So is it more or less loving to tell the person or a person the whole truth as opposed to part of it? Look at Galatians 4.16. So have I become your enemy by telling you the truth? Is that what this is going to boil down to? I'm going to become your enemy by telling you the truth? They, the opponents of the gospel, false teachers, deceivers, counterfeiters, they seek, they eagerly seek you, not commendably, but they wish to shut you out so that you will seek them. But it is good always to be eagerly sought in a commendable manner, and not only when I am present with you. In other words, there's a lot of people out there that want to befriend you, and they are agents of Satan himself to try to steer you away from the truth. And they will lie to you, and they will tell you half-truths. But I'm asking you, is it more or less loving to tell the person the whole truth or not? That's the question. Number two, is it more or less loving to give an unbeliever the whole truth about the sovereignty of sin, not just their sins? Now, that's a tricky one. Because you can get a lot of people to profess belief in Christ based on the um, assumption that they're a sinner. But it's deeper than that. Is it more or less loving to give an unbeliever the whole truth about the sovereignty of sin, not just their sins? Go to Romans 5.12. Romans 5.12. Sometimes love is unpopular, frankly. If you're a parent, you know this in spades, we're often, especially in the teen years, we're very unpopular. <laughs> Romans 5.12, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the offense of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. In other words, we're all born in sin. Is that a very popular thing to say? It doesn't sound very loving, does it? You're born a sinner, spiritually dead. Want to talk? Want to talk about the solution? Or should I just lie to you? Jesus loves me, this I know. Should I just say that? And then I'll just be what? A liar? A poor representative of my Lord? You see, love is not always popular. If you want to be really unpopular, start truly loving individuals. Because most people, I've found, want to be lied to. Again, is it more or less loving to give an unbeliever the whole truth about the sovereignty of sin? not just their sins. How about this one? Is it more or less loving to quote Jesus in the face of arrogance? Go to Mark 8.34. As opposed to, say, not quoting Jesus directly, is it more or less loving to quote Jesus in the face of arrogance? Or shall we um, sidestep Him? Shall we, you ready? Let's tone it down a little bit. Let's not talk about, let's not quote Jesus because Jesus was a judgment preacher, right? Jesus talked about hell seven times more than he talked about heaven. So let's not bring up Jesus right away. As if, as if God needs help in convicting a person. As if God needs our help to shoehorn someone through the narrow gate. 
That's not help. That's actually diminishing him. That's actually misrepresenting him. It's actually frustrating God's salvation plan for a human being. We're not supposed to get in the way. We're not supposed to make things. We're not supposed to salt things ourselves and make things more palatable. Mark 8.34. But here's the thing. A lot of people do. And the churches are much bigger than this as a result. Mark 8.34. And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, Quote, Jesus said, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So again, is it more or less loving to quote Jesus in the face of arrogance? Because that's not going to go over very well. Would someone who's looking for a, what, free ticket to heaven? Where's the sinner's prayer? I heard about this little sinner's prayer thing. Where's the little laminated, you know, bookmark thing? And I can just say this prayer and grandma says, you're in, yay. And we all thanksgiving together and, and lie to each other about our salvation. Where's that thing? <laughs> and it's not here. <laughs> it's, you know why it's not here? Because it's not here. So again, is it more or less loving to quote Jesus in the face of arrogance? One more for you. Is it more or less loving to present an unbeliever with the absolute demands of the gospel, starting with repentance? Since this is our topic for 18 lessons now, is it more or less loving to present an unbeliever with the absolute demands of the gospel, starting with repentance? Go to Luke 13.3. Luke 13.3. This should be uh, red letters, right? Luke 13, 3. Nice and simple, not Pastor Ed. Luke 13, 3. What does it say? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. Any questions? Unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. So just to summarize up here on the board again, is it more or less loving to tell someone the whole truth or not? Inform an unbeliever of their enslavement to sin or not? Quote Jesus in the face of arrogance or not? Or present the absolute demands of the gospel, for example, to repent or not? Which one is more loving? I, I can tell you which one's harder? This is. This is harder. It's a lot, quote, easier to lie to people. Obviously, anyone who's being honest about the contents and the context of the Bible quickly realizes that true love, not man's perverted version of it, does all of these things and with a joy set before it. It may not always be pleasant. There are many times, I mean, the, the people in this audience right now who have been in front of this pulpit the longest, still to this day, if I preach a certain to topic, go like this. I can see it in it. They don't necessarily do this anymore because I keep saying they're doing this, so everybody's like, I better not do that. So they sit on their hands or they do something else. Everybody has a tell. I'm serious. All of you have a tell. And I know when you're getting a little squeamish. Everybody's like, not me. I'll just start wearing sunglasses. <laughs> Be like one of those poker players on TV. True love does all these things. It's not always easy. It's certainly not always popular. But it's righteous. This is a very difficult fight we are engaged in, my friends. 
And speaking of difficult commissions, just as a side note, I want to share something with you. And I don't want you to think this is about me, even though it has everything to do with me. It's just a side note. I want you, I'm going to give you a little glimpse into my life in the import of standing behind a pulpit this way. After class on Sunday, the Spirit had me pondering something I said from the pulpit, followed by some Holy Scripture. And it caused me to do a little soul searching and even some scriptural analysis to see if I was out of line. So allow me to share. First, I said something like, quote, I'm a pastor because I have no choice. And the lingering implication is that I'd rather be doing something else. Right? I mean, if you just extend that a little bit. I'm a pastor because I have no choice. I have no other choice, in other words. And so the, the lingering implication was that I'd rather be doing something else. And I don't want any of you to ever think that about me. Um, unless he says, stop doing this, I'm going to go to my grave doing this. I'm probably going to be like 105, and my dentures are going to be falling out. And you guys are going to, I'll be drooling, and you guys will be stuck. I don't want you to think that about me. While I may share my exhaustion, I have a true joy set before me. But, again, I'm just being open. After saying that on Sunday... I had to check myself against the word to ensure I wasn't speaking or even acting out of line. The verse I prayed on was 1 Peter 5.2, and it came up on Sunday, if you remember, up here in the board. Shepherd the flock of God among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but voluntarily, according to the will of God, and not for sordid gain, but with eagerness. And that hit me. And I said, you have to do a little soul searching. I had to ask myself very honestly in the presence of God, do I do this thing under compulsion? And the answer is yes, but not the kind that Peter was writing about. Peter was writing in context to individuals who were acting as pastors because of external stimuli like family or tradition or intellectualism or prestige even, etc. My compulsion is from God the Holy Spirit, and that's a good thing. So I just wanted you all to know that I take this office so very seriously, never for granted or out of ungodly compulsion. And though you may hear me say things out of frustration, please think of uh, Jesus when he said, Something similar, Matthew 17, 17, up here on the board. And Jesus answered and said, You unbelieving and perverted generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I put up with you? Signed Jesus. <laughs> so I don't feel so bad. I don't, because he was compelled for righteousness sake, as I am. But I'm just letting you know, I don't want you to think that when I say I have no choice, that I'd rather be doing something else. Fair enough? All right, back to our summary of... And that's my life, by the way. You see, my life doesn't end here. I don't get to study and then teach and go home, and I'm like, oh, what's on for the game? I get haunted by things sometimes. Anyways, whatever that's worth. Back to our summary here. Is it more or less loving to tell someone the whole truth, inform an unbeliever of their enslavement to sin, Quote Jesus in the face of arrogance, present the absolute demands of the gospel, for example, to repent. Every line item on the board is offensive, which makes total sense. Given that Jesus, the one the gospel is about, is called the rock of offense. It makes total sense <laughs> that people are going to be offended with the truth. There are probably some of you right now listening to my voice right now and say, when is this going to end? I'm already offended. <laughs> I'm already offended. All I can tell you is that's the way it goes. Your flesh hates the truth. Your flesh is a slave to sin. It likes it. 
it wants it. It doesn't want to depart from it. And when the truth comes along and says, deny that stuff, and then you can follow Jesus Christ, the flesh goes, Psh, that'll be the day. Yet, up here on the board, the glaring issue, and this came out on Tuesday, it seems in contemporary Christianity it is unacceptable to love the way Jesus loved. That's what I'm doing right now. This is unacceptable in contemporary Christianity. People don't like the taste of this teaching. People don't want to hear the truth. Because the truth runs contrary to their lifestyles. They just want somebody to lie to them, even from behind a pulpit. And that, my friends, is a glaring issue in contemporary Christianity. And I say Christianity in quotes. Because I don't believe that what we stand for is the same thing as most Christian churches stand for. And I'm not trying to be a separatist. I'm not trying to elevate us. I'm just saying that's the way it is. And it's grotesque. It seems in contemporary Christianity it is unacceptable to love the way Jesus loved. In fact, as the Spirit pointed out on Tuesday, love's expression, which is grace, is often the victim of perversion. I was having a discussion with um, someone this week, I forget who. But one bad definition that, again, undermines the gospel itself the flesh's version of grace is tantamount to enablement. Same thing, in other words. If the flesh had its way, it wants to define grace as, if you love me, then you'll enable me in my dysfunction. <laughs> if you love me, you'll enable me in my dysfunction. And somehow, that ends up the grace that supposedly in the Bible. There is no way that those two things can coexist in an individual's soul. If you read the Bible, all that gets thrown out. If you ignore the Bible and play pretend Christian, oh, you can keep your perverted bad definition. But you might have a problem with salvation even. That's the point. The flesh's version of grace is tantamount to enablement. If you enable me, I'll know you love me. You know what we call that? Selfish love. Selfish, ungodly love. Do as I demand, and then I'll know you love me. God, I don't want to change. I like being a sinner. I like doing this thing. I don't like this thing. I like this thing. I don't want to deny myself. And if you enable me by grace, you love me so much, you're going to make a special case just for me, and you're going to let me into heaven nonetheless. That's true love. That's grace. No, it's not. That's a lie. That's not love at all. A person who does that to another person, if God did that, he wouldn't love you at all. He doesn't love you. That's why he doesn't do it. <laughs> That's the point. God tells you the absolute truth about your condition that you were born in. We just read it in Romans. That's your condition that you were born in. He tells you the absolute truth about it. And then he tells you the absolute truth about how he can save you from that condition. And that's that. But he's not going to enable you to remain in that condition and still somehow save you. Because he's trying to save you from that condition. <laughs> so repentance, which means turn from that condition, must be part of the gospel. But that's not popular. People would rather have a perverted definition of grace, one that's much closer to enablement than it is to actual truth and love. Some of you by now might be saying, I don't know, it's possible I know you pretty well, aren't we straying a little off the beaten path here? regarding repentance with all this stuff on bad definitions, aren't we kind of straying a little bit? The answer is not at all. In fact, we are honing in on the fundamental issue with each passing lesson up here on the board, the underlying truth. Perversions to grace, mercy, love, repentance, salvation, etc. 
our symptoms. Now, I need you to chew it. This one's going to take you a little while, probably. Give you something to think about this evening and over the weekend. Perversions to grace, mercy, love, repentance, salvation, etc. are symptoms of a much deeper, more insidious issue. That issue is arrogance, which usurps God's sovereign right to be who He is. He says, this is who I am. This is my plan to save you. Well, I don't like that plan. So I'm going to pervert grace. Now, grace is something like enablement. I'm going to uh, pervert mercy so that it gives me a license to sin. I'm going to pervert love so that I can be the most selfish lover on the planet and claim to be abiding in God's love. I'm going to pervert repentance even. So that's just a mental thing. Oh yeah, I guess I'm a sinner. I'll turn from it. If it means I get in the head, I'll turn from it. Okay, I'll turn from it. I'll make it a mental thing. Not a heart issue. Not a whole person issue. I'll just turn it into some watered down definition that I can just claim I've done. Yeah, I know I'm a sinner. Does that count? Who doesn't admit they've sinned at least once in their life? Right? It's e- All right, let me put this in plain language. Is it not really easy to get somebody to profess faith, even? To profess Jesus Christ? To profess repentance? Isn't it easy to, to get somebody to say, are you a sinner or not? Have you ever lied to your parents? Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, I never did, but you sinners did. Right, Mom? It's easy to get somebody to profess, oh yeah, I'm a sinner. But that's not repentance. That's the whole point. Saying you're a sinner and admitting you're a sinner is not repentance. Is that part of it? Sure. You're never going to repent if you don't understand you're a, a sinner. Repentance means the whole person rejects that. And says, I don't want that. I'm not willing to forfeit my soul for that, for all of eternity. I don't want that. I want him. That's not just saying, I'm a, I know I'm a sinner. Can we get on to the good part? Where's my free ticket? That's a symptom. It's a symptom of arrogance. It's a symptom of a person who says, yeah, I see you, God, but you know what? I'm a captain of my own ship. Thank you very much. I'll use you when I need you. You know, when the hits the fan and I'm down and out and I swear I'll go to church more often. I swear I'll do that thing. And then when I'm done, I'm done. I swear I'll read my Bible. Get me through this one thing as you're hanging off the porcelain. Nobody's ever been there? Nobody? <laughs> Kathy, Kathy, you're laughing the loudest. That's what arrogance does. It plays games. It's not, it's not interested in the truth. It's not interested in God's sovereignty because it wants to be its own sovereign. That's the whole point with arrogance. So the point of the board may take a while to chew on, but I can't say it much differently. I just don't want any of you thinking we are stalling, let's, uh, let's say, unnecessarily in our lessons on repentance because we are not. The reason why some of this is difficult to, quote, see is because the God of this world has done a masterful job infiltrating the churches even. That's why this fight is upon us. This is not a fight outside the churches. This is a fight in the churches. The ones with the big steeples with a cross on the top or on the side of the wall. Or that say, I'm a Christian, and everybody walks in and out on Sunday mornings with a t-shirt under their dress shirt and says, I'm a Christian. And they go to the the church barbecue and they play volleyball. And they're not a Christian at all. They're just false professors. That's what we're fighting against. Satan has done a masterful job of infiltrating the churches. Strategically placing even trusted advisors, so to speak, a.k.a. false teachers, in places of authority in our lives. And some of us, let's face it, some of you are like, yep, been there, done that, was duped. 
Some of us even got off track for a time. Which, again, makes sense given Holy Scripture's warning up here on the board. I'll give you the New King James Version of 2 Corinthians 11, 14 to 15. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness, whose end will be according to their works. How many times have we heard that from this pulpit? Do not be surprised at who's in a church. Do not be surprised at people who have the audacity to stand behind a pulpit, let's say with a cross on it, and say, I'm an under-shepherd of Jesus Christ. And they're nothing more than professing unbelievers themselves. Hence, my persistence on this subject. This is not easy, but you know what? It's all for you to protect you, as Peter warns us. Go to 1 Peter 5.8. 1 Peter 5.8. You know, I can't, I can't protect you personally much more than feeding you. But what is it that protects you? It's the Word. The word imparted is what protects you ultimately. And again, I'm just a bus driver saying, hey, chew on this for a little while, chew on that for a little while, be aware of this, take in this scripture, see that scripture right there? Those are the things that protect you. 1 Peter 5, 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Why? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now that may sound grotesque, but that's exactly what it is. Seeking someone to devour. He doesn't want to nibble on your toes. Do you understand? This isn't, a, a, uh, this isn't like a little romantic escapade. He wants to devour you. But what does verse 9 say? Resist him. How? Firm in your pastor? Nope. Firm in your church? Nope. Firm in your spouse? Nope. Firm in your faith. Faith comes from hearing, hearing the word of Christ. This is how you get faith. Do you understand? This is it. This is how your soul is protected. If you never open up this book, if you ignore the good shepherd's advice to open up the book on your own time, then you're leaving yourself exposed. What else can I do? I can only drive the bus and deliver the meals. But if you want to be able to resist the devil, the one who wants to devour you, then be firm in your faith. And faith comes from hearing. Hearing the word of Christ. Knowing that the same experiences of suffering are being accomplished by your brethren who are in the world, after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself perfect confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be dominion, reference to his sovereignty, forever and ever. Amen. Now verse 11 is interesting because I'm convinced that most of us, even I'm guilty of it, uh, often, more often than I'd like to admit, I guess, but I'm convinced that most of us skip right over the closing mocks like that. We're like, oh, that's how he always ends, right? Oh, grace and mercy be to you. And he's shaking hands and kissing babies on the way out the door. Right? You know what I'm saying? It's like, oh, hey, you know, goodbye. No, look at to him be dominion forever and ever. That's not a little subject. But we treat it little. We treat it like a parting, you know, all right, see you later, man. Up here on the board. To him be dominion forever and ever. Amen. Peter reminds us that God is sovereign and there is no other like him. Though that is Satan's great desire, I will make myself like the Most High, said Satan. Isaiah 14, 14. The sons of disobedience, Ephesians 2, 2, share the same objective as their father, the devil, John 8, 44. They're not interested in the sovereignty of God. They're interested in collecting for themselves 
like the rich young ruler, what must I do to obtain eternal life? What, what's the next conquest? You see, because uh, I'm a pretty self-made man up here. God to me is just another conquest. Heaven to me is just another conquest. I'm a self-made man. Look at my life. Look at my trophy wife. Look at my trophy car. Look at my trophy house. Look at my trophy everything. Look at my toupee. Look at my false teeth. Look at my plugs. Look at my, what, $6,000 purse, ladies. Look at my diamond earrings. They swing and they touch my shoulders. They're so amazing, aren't they? I don't know why I sound like a uh, New Yorker all of a sudden. Because <laughs> we don't have those kind of stores up in here. Let's face it, we live in Rehoboth, right? We're lucky to get a pickup with a set of dice in the rearview mirror. And that's considered prestige. <laughs> Peter reminds us that God is sovereign and there is no other like him. Though that is Satan's great desire, as is the case with the sons of disobedience who share the same objective as their father, the devil. This is a war. And if you think this war hasn't come to our own front door, inside the churches of so-called Christian churches, you are uh, lost. You are very much deceived yourselves. Again, to our previous point up here on the board, the underlying truth, perversions to grace, mercy, love, repentance, salvation, etc., are symptoms, symptoms of a much deeper, more insidious issue. That issue is arrogance, which usurps God's sovereign right to be who He is. How many times have you heard someone say, you can have your God, I'll have mine. I'm not going to, listen, I'm not going to say you can't have your God, but you have to let me have mine. And in my head, I'm saying, yeah, mine is the true God of the universe. Yours is the God of this world, Satan himself, or some variant, or some agent of his. But he's not my God. He's not the God of this Bible. I'm afraid to think about how many people have different gods that claim this is the good book in their life. I'm afraid to think about that. I don't know how they arrive at it. You know, well, I do. You ready? This is what they do. Wow, that's a nice looking book. Let me put it over here so it can collect some dust. Let me put my coffee on there every Sunday morning. Let me put my foot up there that has a slipper on it while I'm watching the football game. Now it's, that's, now it's getting in the way. Then it migrates over to a shelf. And then when, you know, the Far Side magazine and, you know, Dilbert and all those things stop pushing, oh, there's only so much shelf space. All right, let's put this up on the top shelf. Okay, now I want to have a hanging plant because my wife's into hanging plants now, right? Now it goes into the, uh, the, the garage and then ends up in storage somewhere. <laughs> the underlying truth is that all these perversions are symptoms of a much deeper, more insidious issue. That issue is arrogance, which usurps God's sovereign right to be who He is. If you do not seek diligently if you do not seek the kingdom first then your god can be whoever you want him to be just know that it's not the god of the bible it's not the one who wants to save you it's the one it's the one that wants to devour you and just by the by since even the gospel is a command from the sovereign god of the universe it is arrogant to reject it not just stupid or ignorant it's arrogant to reject it. That's what we learn in Romans 1, right? A person has to actively suppress the truth about God and who He is. Actively suppress. That's an ongoing thing. That's not just stupid or ignorant. That's arrogant. The gospel is a command. And whenever you reject a command from God... That's what we call arrogance. That's the fruit of arrogance. But arrogance is, let's say, slippery enough to sidestep it 
directly and subvert it in other ways. It's analogous, I was thinking about it this way, maybe this will help. It's analogous to a person who joins, you know, the few, the proud, the Marines. And yet their heart is with the uniform and not the mission. They just want to look good. Why'd you join the Marines? Because they got the best uniforms. Come on. Right? I just want the uniform. Well, suit up. Soldier, time to go to war. No. I was never interested in the mission. I didn't want to actually die for my country. I just wanted to look good. I just wanted to get all the credit. I just want to say that I believe in Jesus Christ. I just want to say that I'm a soldier for Christ. I don't actually want to be one. Because to be one would be to be expressed what Jesus said. Greater love is no one than this than to lay down his life for who? For his brethren, for his friends, for others. I don't want that. Come on. I don't want that. I just want to wear the uniform. Rip my college shirt off at the barbecue. I am Christian. Make a few dives in front of the ladies. That's volleyball, right? Listen, I'm five foot nine on my best day. You think they got chosen for volleyball very often? Give me a break. Jim, we're not all six five. Arrogance is slippery, but it is. It's analogous to a person who says, give me the uniform, but not the mission. Up here on the board, arrogance likes the idea of a peaceful life, but rejects the one who offers it. Just the same thing stated a different way. Arrogance likes the idea of a peaceful life, but it rejects the one who offers it. Instead, it tinkers, let's say, with the fundamentals of God's singular salvation, beginning with his gospel. So I don't really want it that way. How about a hybrid? How about a hybrid model? I'm going to keep a little bit of the self-life and just enough of the righteous life to get into heaven. How about that one? No. No. Nope. That's the way arrogance is. It doesn't always leave a whole good thing behind. Rather, it picks and chooses the pieces It likes and constructs its own stairway to heaven. For you Led Zeppelin fans. And then up here on the board, arrogance believes what it wants to believe. Arrogance believes what it wants to believe. And when it believes it long enough, the Bible says that there's a in a state for human beings called the hardness of the heart. It can believe a lie so long that God will say, okay then, live in it. Okay then, have it your way. And He may even impose judicial blindness or judicial deafness to where a person can't see or hear anymore. And it's a done deal. It's signed, sealed, and delivered. They chose to reject the holy God of the universe. They tried every which way to save them. And they said, no. It's more important to me that I preserve my self-life. It's more important to me that I remain in the condition in which I was born. Because I reject having to deny all that just to receive saving faith in Jesus Christ. I reject that. And God says, okay then. Don't ask me what, when, where that is in someone's life, because I don't know. That's between them and the Lord. But I know what the Bible says. At some point, hardness of the heart. Callousness even. I think I've taught you the Greek on that in the past. Callousness even. A toughness of the heart. It becomes impenetrable. And God says, okay then, you're deaf, you're blind. Go on your own way. Sentence is secured. Now the difficulty in the churches for arrogance is that very often, like you have right now, 
sitting smack dab in front of it is the Holy Bible. Now, an arrogant person can either read it honestly, be humbled, and be delivered, or they can do what others seem to be doing in contemporary Christianity. That is, they read the Bible, I suppose, on occasion, but pick and choose pieces that they like and dismiss the pieces that they don't by twisting Scripture through what is best described as lawyering. As lawyering. Take the letter of something. Let's throw it out. Okay, if you just backwards engineer, how do you end up with a law? Uh, preferably, some good people get together, often elected people, let's just say. They say, what do, what's good for society? I don't know. Let's make murder illegal. Okay, let's write some laws. Do not murder. If you do this way, then, you know, you may even get the death penalty. Okay? The spirit of the law was, let's protect the people in our communities, and let's write a law. Okay? Someone murders somebody. A sleazebag lawyer comes in and says, well, you see, it says right here, it doesn't say that if they murdered them this way, if they killed them this way, that they're guilty. And they get off. Is that honest? Nope. Does it happen every day? Of course it does. Why? Lawyering. Lawyering. There's a difference between the letter and the spirit, and that's something that is absolutely in the Bible. There exists right and wrong, righteousness and unrighteousness, light and darkness, good and evil. The spirit of the Bible embodies the prior. Fleshly lawyering interprets the letter of the law instead of depending wholly upon the Holy Spirit's interpretation. In other words, to heck with what the Spirit's convicting me of right now in my soul. To heck with what I know is right. It says right here, or it doesn't say right here explicitly, and I really want to do this thing, or I really don't want to do that thing, so I'm going to do a little lawyering. And I'm going to play pretend, but you know what? Here's the deal. God sees the heart. God sees the heart. And um, you don't get away with it. You don't get to lawyer your way into heaven. You don't get to lawyer your way out of transgressions. You don't get to lawyer with God. The greatest lawyer ever created was Satan, which means attorney, which means lawyer. <laughs> You're not better than him. And you know where he's going? The lake of fire. Just saying, your chances are kind of slim. If Satan couldn't pull it off, and he's a lot smarter than you, you're never going to pull it off. And you're not meant to pull it off. That's the point. But yet arrogance goes tooth and nail until the day it goes to the grave. John 5, 38, 39. You do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. It is these that testify about me. Signed, Jesus. Let me give you another passage before I close. Go to Romans 2.12. Romans 2.12. On this particular topic, Romans 2.12. Romans 2, verse 12. Now try to see the forest through the trees here. There's some other contextual things going on. Romans 2.12 for all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law, and all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. For when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law uh, to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God 
and know his will and approve the things that are essential, being instructed out of the law, and are confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of the immature, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge and of the truth. You, therefore, who teach another, do you not teach yourself? You who preach that one shall not steal, do you steal? You who say that one should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? You who abhor idols, do you rob temples? You who boast in the law, through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles because of you, just as it is written. For indeed circumcision is of value if you practice the law. But if you are a transgressor of the law, your circumcision has become uncircumcision. In other words, this is not about what you're doing. It's about your heart. This is not about being circumcised or not circumcised. This is about what's going on in your heart. So if the uncircumcised man keeps the requirements of the law, will not his uncircumcision be regarded as circumcision? And he who is physically uncircumcised, if he keeps the law, will he not judge you who through having the letter of the law and circumcision are a transgressor of the law? For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. And here's the capstone statement. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. Remember the plague in the Jew, with the Jews. They thought keeping the law to the T is how they gained salvation. That is a lie. There's a spirit behind the law that convicts and works on the human heart. Again, circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter. God the Holy Spirit, if you want to think this way in Paul's analog here, circumcises the heart, makes a person a true Jew, a true child of God. So therefore, circumcision is that which is of the heart by the Spirit, not by the letter, and his praise is not from men, but from God. Up here on the board, the point the Spirit's making, I told you there was a lot of background going on there. Hopefully you were able to see the forest through the trees. Not by the letter. Mental assent to the letter of God's law is void of divine substance. God changes a believer's heart, not just his mind about Holy Scripture. This is is true circumcision. Repentance is a perfect example to ponder. Jesus Christ said, repent. His apostles, his disciples said, repent. How many times have I said it from behind this pulpit? What is that to you? Is it just something you can say, yep, I'm a sinner. I guess I don't like sin because I'm not supposed to, so now what? Or is it actually a part of the convicting ministry of God the Holy Spirit in that person's life? Is it the Spirit working with a person's heart? Is it conviction, not merely mental assent? Because that's what lawyering is all about. It looks for loopholes. It looks for advantages based on the letter. But the Spirit is behind the letter, my friends. And that's what counts, because God sees the heart. Again, mental assent to the letter of God's law is void of divine substance. God changes a believer's heart, not just his mind about Holy Scripture. This is true circumcision. And repentance is a perfect example to ponder. And I'll leave you with this. For example, there are some who say that repentance is merely a change of mind. However, the Spirit's taught us over and over again through the word, repentance is a heart issue, not just a mind one. Repentance is a heart issue, not just a mind one. Again, we'll just continue with what is repentance and who gets to define it. Let's bow our heads. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this wonderful opportunity to gather together as family, to fellowship this way, to break bread, the very bread of life that is the word of God. We just ask for your blessings as we take what we've learned out to a lost and dying world, Father, that needs it so desperately. We ask these things in Jesus Christ's precious name.
By the power of the Spirit, we do pray. Amen. Thank you.